Hello, I am Jay Ann Campanelli. And before we get started, I'm just going to give the panelists a minute to introduce themselves. So why don't we start with Emma and then go alphabetically? Okay, um, I'm Emma Hegem. I am the managing editor at uh, Future House Publishing. Um, so I work with uh, acquisitions, uh, developmental and line editing, um, and I work on science fiction and fantasy novels and middle grade adventures. Cool. I'm Julie Wright. I actually had to go look down the list. I'm like, so it's alphabetically, I'm a writer. I should know this one, right? <laughs> so you didn't know. I was already so you. Me. Yay. Um, <laughs> I'm Julie Wright. I write uh, fantasy, science fiction, and romance. Um, my romance tends to be my most popular, best-selling thing, so I don't know what that says about me. I like writing fantasy and science fiction best, but, you know, romance is where it is my bread and butter. Um, I have written 25 novels. I have 15 traditionally published, and six, the 16th is coming out in two weeks, and it is a captain for Caroline Gray. I'm super excited about it, and, yeah, that's me. Uh, great. I'm I'm Kenny Baldwin. Um, I write historical fantasy, and then I, I also teach sketch comedy writing over at BYU. Um, and so we focus a lot on dialogue there. Uh, and yeah, happy to be here. I'm Stephen Gashler. Um, I do a little of everything. I kind of I write uh, young adult fantasy humor novels. Um, I've also dabbled with children's picture books. Um, I compete as a storyteller, and I've won some awards doing that. Also, uh, uh, compose and record music. Um, this is my Viking rock album we did a couple years back. And uh, I run a, a YouTube channel, and I uh, write and compose and produce musical theater. Sweet. Steven really wanted to be asked this. How much can you bench press? <laughs> well... I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I am Jay Ann Campanelli. I write primarily romance with a side of horror slash parody. I have one book published. It just came out last month. It's called Pride and Poor Judgment. And I have a short story <laughs> in an anthology about zombie chickens. Um, so we're just going to dump right into it. So Let's lay the foundation a little bit. What set? What makes dialogue sound unnatural, unrealistic, or realistic? Well, it's always fun to start with the bad examples. Um, so when I thought about that question, I thought about a lot of early dialogue I would write, and I think there's a tendency to, to do a lot of bad things, such as um, to mention the person's name a lot. Bob, comma, how are you doing? Bob, did you know this? Bob, 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 Bob. Um, another is, I think, to restate the same thing a lot. Um, another is, you know, everybody having the same voice, as it were. Um, there, those are off the top of my head. We I, one of my, like, things, that, that the info dump in dialogue where the reader needs to know this, so you have characters have a conversation so that the reader discovers this thing that they need to know. So, you know, above, as you would know, there's a, you know, outbreak of the purple spots at the factory today. Well, if you have to say, as you know, and Bob already knows. And why are we having this conversation? You know, it's like, why, why? That thing makes me nuts. I hate that one. Um, one thing that I think um, is a pretty common mistake in unnatural sounding dialogue is when the characters have no reason to be like saying or sharing the things that they do. You know, a random stranger walks up to you and says, like, how is your day? And you're like, well, actually. And you tell them like every single thing that happened about your day. They mean like... <laughs> hi, how are you, right? Like, that's not an appropriate response. Or if someone's asking you about, you know, the death of your mother, you're not going to, like, you know, just, oh, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, and, like, tell the full story, right? You've got to really to, um, like, why would your character share these things? You know, is this something that they would say out loud right now? And, you know, the emotional motivation and goals of their dialogue is going to make it seem a lot more believable that anyone would actually ever say these things out loud to another person. Yeah, um, I, I love that. Um, 
And then I was I was also going to say, I think that uh, for me, I feel as though writing realistic dialogue is the furthest thing from my objective whenever I'm writing fiction, because 70 percent, you know, 80 percent, so maybe even 90 percent, if you're talking to a teenager of actually realistic things they say to you in a conversation you would never want in a book because it would make for just such a slow scene. Um you know, thing, little small talk, like, how are you? And, oh, I'm fine. How have you been? How are the, none of that belongs in your story. You know what I mean? And so um, for me, it's important just to kind of focus in on when, at least when I think about natural dialogue and writing, what I'm hoping for is dialogue that makes the story feel natural. Not, I, I'm not trying to emulate real life or um, emulate a conversation as a, almost like a BBC documentary on conversation. You know what I mean? It's like, we're trying to give you the most exciting. I, Alfred Hitchcock once said, uh, you know, movies are meant to be uh, real life with all the boring parts taken out. So. Imagine trying to actually emulate a teenage conversation. <laughs> Have you ever eavesdropped on a teenager having conversation? It's, it's, filled with ums and errs and stutters and, and words that don't even make sense. And, and they have their own, you know, especially if they're all friends, they, they speak their own language. And yeah, you would really not want to emulate that because it makes the story stutter and you don't want to do that. Even among adults, but if we were to have a transcript of this conversation and see all the ums and uhs and yeahs and buts and yeah. <laughs> well, and aside from just being boring like if you have your character stuttering over stuff which sounds really natural you know if I trip over a word in my sentence and keep talking you're going to think nothing of it but if you read it on a page you're like oh are they like embarrassed are they lying like what does this mean and so if you're putting that onto the page it better actually carry meaning you can't just be doing it because real people trip over words um because you're going to accidentally make all these implications or confuse people uh, with, the, with the dialogue yeah, I mean, we were on a panel earlier with, uh, I think Troy Lambert said something about uh, hearing your books in audiobook form. Mm -hmm. And how he suggested even preparing like a version of your book for uh, the audiobook narration, because it's just that different. And hearing all the dialogue tags and everything is is crazy. Now, some authors are really resistant to that. Like J.K. Rowling, for example, when, he, when she uh, had her audiobooks done, she insisted it was exactly as written, but she did so for the specific purpose of if kids were trying to follow along in the book, she didn't want anything out of sync. And so, you know, there's a separate purpose for that, but um, it, it's even, you just have to pay such close attention to this is a written word story. And for that purpose, there's going to be a very selective uh, take on dialogue. Really quick, can I just share a, a, just a horrible story about audiobooks and dialogue and things? You <laughs> careful about. I, I'll be fast. Always. So, I wrote um, a middle grade science fiction um, series called Hazardous Universe with artist Kevin Wasden, who I actually met at LTUE, and that's how we got together and did that whole thing, but it was pretty cool. Um, but the character's name is Hap Hazard. That's, that's his name. And so his last name is Hazard and it, his family calls him Hap. That's just, that's just his name. So uh, if you go Hap Asked, written it's fine <laughs> audio it sounds like the guy's cussing it sounds like something else entirely and this is a kid's book the audio book was sort of awful and when i recognize that that happened it's like oh stars i did that uh, so yeah i learned a lot from audiobooks anyway That's, yeah no great. i really appreciate that story um so that kind of leads us right into our next question what is the difference between and we've kind of touched on this a little bit. What is the difference between natural conversation when you're talking to someone else and natural dialogue in a book? I think the biggest difference like is uh, action. Um, as, as Kenneth noted, it's not necessarily trying to mimic realism. Um, so it could seem natural, um, but really... It is very driven. It has to be advancing um, the state of the story um, or it becomes tedious. Whereas in reality, we can spin in circles all the time and get nowhere. We enjoy those conversations, right? We spin in circles we, and we... Uh Real conversation, it, the, it meanders a lot and it doesn't have to have a purpose other than, hey, we're just talking. But 
in a book, you need your, I, I have what I, I, I consider dialogue should have to pay its rent. So you consider yourself, you're, you're the landlord of, of this property and your dialogue has to pay its rent. And if it doesn't pay its rent, it needs to get evicted. And so I'm a mean landlord when it comes to words. And so dialogue very much has to pay its rent. So it has to move the plot forward, has to you know reveal something in a character, build the relationship. There's so many things that dialogue should do and if it's really really fantastic dialogue it will do all of it but it has to do at least one of you know one of those things i've got like a list of five things that i feel like dialogue should always have to do and no i can't come up with all five right now i can only come up with three but there's a legendary editor uh soul stein who passed away uh relatively recently wrote this fabulous book called stein on writing um and he breaks down like every every written a portion of your chapter can be categorized into either immediate action or action that's happening, you know, on the page, uh, on stage, so to speak, action uh, or action that's happening off stage, you know, um, where you're recounting something that that happened in order to bring you to the immediate scene. And Solstein argues that dialogue is pretty much always immediate action because the conversation is happening right there. And stuff is getting hashed out. But Sol Stein is making an assumption here that the dialogue is uh, is doing something, right? So <laughs> to kind of bring up uh, Julie's point, I've had a conversation, you know, a two and a half hour conversation where all we did was say over and over and over again how displeased we were with the series finale of Game of Thrones. And we loved it. You know, we could have gone another two hours if we hadn't been cut off because we just love talking about it. But in order to have that immediacy, yeah, you just have to have some new things getting revealed. Julie has a list. I've got a list of dialogue should either be advancing the plot, kind of like Steven said, uh, increasing the conflict between characters or revealing some vital piece of information for the story. And it's like you can... One of the great things about dialogue is you can literally go through and just next to each thing of dialogue, make sure it has one of those. And if it doesn't, you can just snip it right out. Yeah, I, dialogue is is very much a, a showing place in your story. Um, and so if, if you're just trying to communicate information to your reader, um, a lot of times you can just, and then they greet at each other and then move on, right? You don't have to play that all out in front of the readers because there's nothing they're going to learn from that. Um, but then if you have something that, that the readers need to see for themselves, something that they need to um, understand that maybe the point of view character doesn't, because dialogue is a great way to show other perspectives um, for people that your point of view character doesn't have. Um, or if you know, you're know you trying to show like this relationship is really awkward, then maybe you do show the greetings and you have them say, hi, hello, how are you today? And it feels awkward to read. And if that's what you're going for, then you, you've accomplished something. Um, but you've got to remember that your dialogue is is um, showing something and it should be conveying particular emotions and it should be conveying uh, you know all of these implications and things. And if you're really just trying to say exactly what's happening in the dialogue to your readers, then just you know throw that in the narration, move on and keep going because um, that's not worth taking a whole conversation to to say. All right, awesome. So, <clears throat> When we're looking at revising and going through and going back to look at your dialogue that you've already written, what are the most common mistakes that you guys have seen in your own or someone else's dialogue that you've read or written? For me, I think it's being too on the nose, meaning stating the obvious or repeating what has already been said, being a little too much to the point. I've heard it argued that uh, in Western communication, we tend to put forth the thesis and then we defend it. And we're very forthright about how we talk. In Eastern communication, it tends to be a little more cryptic. Um, you speak in metaphors and you let the reader fill in the gaps and make the conclusion for themselves. It's a bit of a generalization, but there is some truth in it. And I found with professional dialogue, it tends to actually mimic the Eastern model a little bit more instead of stating exactly where you've been and where you are and where you're going and what you're doing while you're doing it, you tend, good dialogue tends to um, be a little more removed and let, again, the viewer or the reader or the listener fill in the connections. A mistake that I, I two books um, were awful 
I don't know how they got published. I really don't. They were awful. But um, one of them in particular, I somebody should have called the adverb police on me because he said, happily, she said dejectedly. I mean, oh, my stars. It was like I had 40 on one page in one area. It was just so bad. And I'm still mortified by that. I, I am. And I'm super glad that I grew up as an author and, I'm, and I don't make those mistakes anymore. But it shames me to my toenails that that is out there in the world, visible. You used adverbs. Shame on you. Oh, no. Yeah. I was going to... I used them. It was that I used them. I mean, as if they were the yeah. only words in my literary toolbox. It was... Because I think adverbs are words. You should be able to use an adverb. That's fine. I just don't think you should only use adverbs, which is kind of... I did full sentences with nothing but adverbs. It was really awful. I mean, it was an art form, really. I should have won an award. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I think that's a great point, Julie, because like, I, I think uh, that is, that's advice that's very easy to blog. Um, you know, when you're like, if you're writing an article, like five tips to improve your writing, it's really easy to just say, cut out all your adverbs. And, you know, I've even seen things that suggest like use control F L Y and find every adverb in your book and get rid of it. And it's like, this is terrible advice. <laughs> you know what I mean? You've got to be able to use adverbs. It's one of the forms of words you have at your disposal. Um, but, and I think maybe this is kind of Julie's point, right? Like you, you want to prefer to use the words themselves to, to say what you're going to say. Adverbs are particularly helpful in my opinion, when you are saying one thing in the dialogue on purpose, but trying to have the character express something different by the way they're saying it, right? Like um, there was one example that came up that was uh, the, what was the, they said like, oh yeah, you could say like, here, hand me that book. He said threateningly, or like he said cagely or something. I'm like, okay. And they're like, or you could say, give me that book now or I'll shoot you. And I'm like, well, those, oh, yes, you don't need an adverb in the second case, but you're also saying something crazy in the scene all of a sudden. And it's not like in a lot of characters wheelhouses to do something like that. They will probably opt for just a tone of voice that is, um, that, that, you know, is just a little bit threatening or like some, you know, no one's going to just actually come out and threaten someone. So I, that's funny. My, yeah, my error is the opposite of Julie's error. Don't get rid of every single adverb. <laughs> Try to find a happy middle ground. <laughs> All words have a purpose, but some get tired quicker than others. Oh, that's great. I want that on my wall right here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> very... <laughs> Emma, did you have anything to add on that? Um, I honestly, like, we've been talking about adverbs, and I don't remember what the original question was. Where so, no, it's okay. Here? The question was, what are the most common mistakes you see in when you're editing dialogue, whether it's yours or someone else's, what are the most common mistakes you've seen? Um, yeah, I think on the nose dialogue is uh, um, a big problem because, I mean, sometimes those are things that, you know, real people would actually say, um, but in the story, it can, it can feel um, like it's not doing enough things and it can make your conversations take up too much space and, and you always want to try to do more than one thing if you can, so trying to get implications across um, without your characters having to say them to each other is going to leave more space for your your readers to uh, feel like they're participating and be involved in the story instead of just having it spoon fed to them. Um, so you know, always good to try to leave space for your readers to get involved in conversations like that by leaving things um, you know, kind of more open or, or, or unsaid. And um, that can feel more natural, even if it's not actually realistic, it'll feel more natural to them. Um, they're invested in it. Um, so... Yeah, I think that's one of the one of the most common uh, things that I encounter, and then also the framework of the dialogue, um, like she was talking about with the adverbs, and um, making sure you have the right body language, and and that you're using your paragraph breaks and stuff, and um, that you're um, you know putting enough information around the dialogue, but maybe not into your dialogue tag. Um, I see a lot of like really long dialogue tags where someone's like, oh yeah, so he said as he juggled six balls and rode on an elephant and, you know, wrote a letter to his sister. And you're just like, goodness gracious, I don't even remember what he said anymore. Um, and none of that clarified for me, like, how he was saying it. I didn't get any, you know, emotion from it. Those are completely separate ideas and, you know, things that are happening maybe simultaneously, um, but but not building together. 
Um, and so keeping keeping the information separated from your dialogue tags so that you, know, you, can, you can bounce between dialogue and other things that are happening in the scene and not have those in the same sentence trying to all happen completely simultaneously. Yeah. Steven said something really good earlier and I wanted to revisit that. Um, one of the biggest mistakes that I made as a, a newer writer was I, I would reassign dialogue to different characters in a scene. And if you're being true to the character's voice, that works, but I would give the exact same statement to a different character because, oh, that, you know, person A just spoke up. I can't have them speaking again now. I got to give that to person B. And so when you're going through and you're writing and you're editing your dialogue, you want to make sure that each character has a distinctive voice. So that brings up the next question. How do we build a voice to to help kind of supplement and augment um, this natural dialogue? Well, maybe um, there was a, there was a, I mean, this was a true story, but it is, it was made popular recently by a Netflix kind of true crime special. Um, but if you go back uh, to the Unabomber, um, the Unabomber was a guy who sent out bombs in the mail uh, in the United States. And, um, and he sent out like a manifesto of like the reason he was doing this and his views on society and stuff like that. And the way they ended up catching the Unabomber was a brand new branch of uh, forensic science called forensic linguistics, in which some poor sap at the FBI literally combed through the Unabomber's manifesto and was able to identify the individual the actual person by the small nuances that he used in his writing. So, you know, it was just like this turn of phrase, the way that he phrases this sentence, you know, the way that he puts the, he, the examples he uses, all of that, he was able to narrow down to like a certain educational class and then a specific institution and then even a specific graduating class. And eventually, finally, with some other context clues, they were able to narrow it down. So the idea that you could actually, from the entire, you know, 350 million people in the U.S., narrow down someone's identity just by breaking down the the manuscript they sent out um, is a great clue that it doesn't have to be very dramatic. You know, um, I for my students, I sometimes pose a challenge to them to say, if you want to see if you if your characters have a distinct voice, get rid of every dialogue tag in a scene just for I mean, not for publishing, but just for fun and see if you can give it to someone and they can keep track of who's saying what. Um, if they can, you've got a pretty good indication the voices are strong. Now you might need to dial it back a little bit in some cases, right? Because you don't want everything to be very strong. If you look at um, like uh, Benedict Cumberbatch's Sherlock, you can always tell it's Sherlock, even if you just read a sentence on paper compared to Watson. Um, and so anyway, I think, I. I, it doesn't have to be strong, but it can just be, um, you know, a certain way of viewing the world or a certain outlook on life, certain examples they always kind of come back to, things like that. Yeah, that's a, um, I've also heard that called the, the dialogue scrim test. Um, oh, yeah, cool. The, the concept in uh, animation is the same thing. If you put the character behind a scrim, can you still tell who, who it is uh, by distinctive features? Um, that's a really good editing tool when you're going through and trying to figure out, okay, are my characters distinct? You can take away the um, the dialogue tag. So I'm really glad you brought that up. Uh, what else? You can do that to yourself too. You don't necessarily have to have someone else read it. If you remove all the dialogue tags and then walk away for like an hour and come back and you can't assign the dialogue tags, <laughs> then you know that you yourself don't understand the voices of the characters. But if you can assign the dialogue tags then to yourself, then you're like, okay, like how do I know this is this character? And sometimes that can help you figure out maybe subconsciously kind of what you're doing um, to help differentiate those characters. So you can become a little bit more purposeful about that. Um, so that you can then, you know, use that in the future and, and you know, know that you have that happening because a lot of writing is, you know, subconscious when you do it the first time. Um, so if you can kind of master, okay, what is it that I'm actually doing here? What is it that, you know, feels like is happening? And you can sometimes be more purposeful about it later on. A weird kind of example is Phineas and Ferb. I mean, Phineas does all the talking <laughs> and Ferb says, what, two words? And, and I know this is just a weird example, but... 
I mean, when Ferb speaks, everybody stops to listen because everything he, he he's got such great economy with words that his character is vastly different from his brothers, who just doesn't stop talking. And it's it's really a fantastic way of knowing which character is is who. And I think like if your 20 year old sounds like your four year old who sounds like the 80 year old, you've done something. And so you need to think of things like age differences and socioeconomic background and the environment in which they live. And there's, there's different things that you can utilize in order to make a voice ring authentic, while also not heading into stereotypes because not all, you know, 50 year old housewives are going to sound the same. So they're going to have their own unique brand. Like, like Kenny said, you know, narrowed it down from all the millions of people in the United States and you were able to find the guy based off of his phrase. And so, I mean, they're not all going to sound the same, but taking those things into account will help give you those variances of, of sentence structure and so forth. For me, developing believable voices is very much an auditory process. I know C.S. Lewis recommended to his students that they always read their dialogue out loud. And having just finished one of his novels, there's no way he followed that advice. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> some of his characters in his, in his sci-fi series just like do info dump for paragraphs upon paragraphs of exposition. But that's beside the point. Um, it's a good practice. And in, as one who writes a lot of theater, I have the benefit of, of actually seeing and hearing my characters come alive and hearing how it sounds when spoken out loud. But even when I'm writing novels, I do the same thing. I always talk to myself out loud and and try to just role play my characters and so I probably look like a lunatic that's why I like to write with a closed door but it makes it fun and, and engaging and if it sounds right I think that's probably the best indicator that it is right awesome oh sorry tip me you had something I would have about one other tip about being uh, distinctive with your characters is that sometimes they might not have obvious like, different backgrounds like you know if you have two siblings who are talking you know, maybe they don't have that different of voice. I know people can't tell me and my sister apart when we talk, even though like we're otherwise very, very different people, but we have the same language because we you know, grew up in the same place. Um, but you can always tell which one of us is talking uh, based on, you know, like the, the motivations behind what we're saying. So if you have two characters who are, you know, having a conversation about something, hopefully they don't agree about everything. Um, you know, they should be disagreeing about something. They should be coming from different places. They should know different information. And so if you're using the different, uh, like, emotions that the character has, like, different purpose they have, you know, if one of them is trying to get this conversation to come to a certain outcome and the other one's going the other way, then it would be really clear from each line of dialogue uh, which one is talking based on which of those goals they're pushing towards. Um, so sometimes if you can't get... a Kind of more linguistic voice difference, you can still get a really obvious character difference that makes the dialogue really identifiable. All right, awesome. This is a really great conversation and I hate to cut us off, but I just want to get a couple more um, things in before we jump to Q&A. So we're going to talk about some dialogue customizations for a bit and so where do you use disfluencies like filler words, um, uh, like, um, where do you use or avoid slang? How do you use dialects? And how do you avoid overusage of all of the above? Sorry, that was a packed question. <laughs> I think we can... yeah, starting. With, oh, go ahead. Starting with a slang, um, you probably want to avoid diving diving too deep into any one particular. Uh, you know, type of slang for um, a community and probably pick certain kind of keywords that you're going to use throughout the book because um, you don't want to specialize too much so that no one else can, you know, read the book because if you talk exactly like a real 14-year-old does today in your YA novel in about two years, that's going to be complete gibberish. And so you want to avoid being a, too specific with your slang and with your you know, abbreviations and your text terminology and all those sort of things. And, and just use them just a slight flavoring uh, throughout uh, when they when they really um, are, are things that you can use the same thing kind of over all as part of a voice that you know, character says just in general um, or a certain group of will understand or, or something like that. It kind of needs to earn its place or else you are just potentially uh, make it unintelligible to other people. 
I think it depends on your genre. If you are going for realism, um, then the slang and the ifs and the ands in the book and the are probably fairly important. Um, I don't write realism at all. If I did, I do write period pieces, and they would probably sound more like John Steinbeck, you know, based on where it's put. Um, but the show I'm putting on right now is set in 1929, and admittedly, it probably has a pretty modern feel to it. Uh, to give that flair of authenticity, you know, I do throw in period phrases such as Gad's Budlikins and hey, baby vamp, let's go Bonnie mugging over at this, the creep joint. You know, phrases that don't mean anything to us anymore, but add this air of credibility. Again, if I were going for realism, though, that wouldn't be enough to sell it. But I'm not. I'm going for farce. And so it's OK that uh, it's sort of a modern voice kind of set in a fantasy past um, because that's the tone and it's for general audiences. And so that makes it OK. In my opinion. I think that is really sage advice about, you know, your genre. And I think also uh, bringing it down to your setting. Um, so I grew up in a, in a relatively British family. My dad was born in Oldham and, um, you know, a lot of British relatives. And I've always prided that, you know, about my my just, you know, like a little sense of identity for the Southern Californian kid. Um, but uh uh, I, you know, as I was writing um, uh, my last book, which takes place in England in the 19th century, um, I had the benefit of a bunch of beta readers from the UK who chimed, who who had no hesitations about chiming in on Americanisms, um, and you know, they were things I would have never thought about, right? Like the word "guess," you know, to say "I guess" is like. I can't tell you the number of comments I got back of like, oh, the, the, they would guess back then. You know, it's almost like they were talking to each other and laughing behind my back of like, he used to guess, you know? And it's like, I'm sorry, I will change them all to suppose so you can feel good about it. But I, I think a really great um, dialogue test for accents, you know, if I, I, I typically don't change the form of dialogue, like Mark Twain style of like, you gonna get into the boat, you know, and stuff like that. Cause I find it slows down the reading experience. Um, but if you want to do something like that, or if you're writing a character of a certain background, um, you must be brave enough before publication to have someone from that background read the character. Uh, because they'll just tell you straight how it is. And, you know, you might find out you were accidentally racist or something and and you did not intend that. But wow, what a thing you would want to catch before you published it. You know what I mean? And so um, I think I think it depends on the genre. It depends on the setting and and use that as your backstop. You know, have some readers that you can send it to to say, hey, is this British? Are there any I guesses in here that I would have never thought? I didn't know. I didn't know, you know. Awesome. All right. Let's jump straight into Q&A. Lisa asks, can you use dialogue just to cut tension or change the pacing, even if it doesn't serve the other purposes mentioned at the beginning of the panel? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, you can use dialogue as humor. Uh, humor is a great tension cutter and um, kind of slows things down a little bit. Um, I wouldn't rely exclusively on that, but it, it's definitely one of the tools in your toolbox. I think also you have the, um, the, the concept of it reveals a character. So if a character, their go-to is humor to cut down on tension, they're like, they feel the tension rising. They're like, oh, I don't like this. It makes me uncomfortable. So then they insert humor in there to cut that tension down. That reveals a lot about the character as well. So I don't think that that's ever a throwaway thing. I think that that actually that that gives the reader a little bit more insight into characterization. Yeah, I think the pursuit of action in narrative includes taking breaks and breathers in order to prepare for the next adventure. So it can't all be just plot, 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 plot. Awesome. Um, let's go to the next question. Felicity asks, in a real conversation, context is heavily implied. How do you gauge how much context to give the reader to let them in on the situation without being too expository? Hmm. 
That is a good one. That is a good one. You can well, use body uh, language a lot. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, Here, please, I'll, for, I'll keep forming my thought. <laughs> body language and nonverbal cues are really great for giving the reader context and cluing them in. So, for example, if someone's saying something, but they're not looking you in the eye, or they're not looking the person they're addressing in the eye, that kind of tells the reader some things. Are they being dishonest? Are they nervous? Uh, what's going on? And so you can use, um, I think... Emma mentioned this in this panel or another panel I was on, and I'm so sorry, um, about, no, it was this one, um, about using a stutter um, or tripping over your words or using disfluencies. Um, those are very intentional choices in writing dialogue because if someone stutters, well, what's going on? What are they thinking? Why Do, do they have a stutter? Or is if they don't usually do this... Um, is there something they're hiding? Um, and so you can use little cues without being heavy handed to accomplish that purpose. Another great tool, and Stephen can back me up on this, is um, it, it's something that, that comes from a theater background or, uh, or film background, it's called scene work. Um, and imagine your characters on a stage as they're talking. And if, it's, if they're just both standing there talking, then everything's going to have to be in the dialogue or their facial expressions or something like that. Um, but if you can give the characters something to do while they're talking, suddenly your palette of colors to use uh, as far as expression goes just becomes, you know, 10 hundred fold. Um, and you can even say, I mean, think about the fun, right? If you have a character talking to another one that's ironing a shirt or something and character A says, I'm sorry, I ate the last sandwich. Um, and they, and you, you don't even have to have character B respond. You can just say, you know, they burned the shirt or, you know, like you can have them do something in response with the activity. That is a really fun way to, to like have them speak without speaking and provide a lot of context. Oh, I saw this question earlier and actually I've pre <laughs> preformed a response. Um, so in my humble opinion, there are some authors who are really fabulous uh, dialogue writers out there. Um, it's much easier to find really fabulous uh, screenplay writers, in my opinion, for dialogue. Uh, so I think go to TV and film um, and even radio if you want some really great dialogue. Aaron Sorkin is kind of a master at dialogue. If you watch The Social Network, he does a lot of great um, He's, like, he presents a whole writer's toolbox for dialogue with, you know, answering questions with questions or question with silence and using threats and pauses and like off kilter responses. And uh, yeah, so Aaron Sorkin, anything he's written, that's kind of love that guy. I think the one caveat I might add to using like screenplays or radio or something that's um, not a book to learn about dialogue is that sometimes you do have to put exposition more into dialogue in a movie or something where you don't have that narration happening. Um, so do to kind of keep that in mind when you're, you know, actually putting stuff down in a book that, you know, even if the character had to say that out loud in the movie, you might be able to pull that out of the dialogue and just put it next to the dialogue and, and add that directly into your book and, and have that little added extra realism because you have those other tools that the movie didn't have particularly true with radio or audio only stuff where they have to describe like, wow, look at these trees. You know? <laughs> Otherwise you don't know there are trees there. Liz Kazukas, um, spelled C-Z-U-K-A-S, has really great um, natural dialogue in her book. She writes some of the funniest contemporary YA romance I've ever read. Um, her characters are very distinct. You can tell who's talking without the dialogue tags. Um, and the the banter and the chemistry between the characters is just great. All right, uh, let's take one more question and then I think it's gonna be time to wrap up. Green Dragon asks, what, what's an effective way of writing an argument where there are interruptions and people talking over each other? I would use your point of view very carefully in an argument like that. Um, whoever's perspective you're in uh, can can flavor what information the readers actually hear. 
And then, you know, the other stuff that might be happening, you can just kind of, oh, and she was still talking in the background. Um, and then, you know, just make sure that you cut back to those other characters when they say something really important. But by using your point of view to pick and choose which details, you can kind of have everybody shouting at once without your character have to read every single line that's happening all at the same time out loud. That would be way too slow compared to the way that actual argument would be playing out. It's also a really great way to heighten tension, I think, to have that those interruptions, especially if they are having an argument. That would that would be a great way to heighten tension and make people feel like because the, all those interruptions are super irritating because I have a point to make and I want to make it and and this is getting in the way of that. And so it, it's I think that's that's a fun way to create greater conflict in an argument. Um, how to how to process it though I think Emma now that hit the nail on the head with being very careful with your point of view character and what are they saying versus what the other character would be saying. Awesome. I think it has to do with pacing. If you have a lot of short terse uh, comments, unfinished sentences, people interrupting each other, you are rising the tension and you are in in increasing the pace. So if that's what you want, then it's okay. And if that's not what you want, then you want, would probably want to avoid that. All right, awesome. I wish we had more time for questions, but um, unfortunately, I think we have to call it here. So let's just, um, let's go reverse alphabetical this time <laughs> and just any parting thoughts where um, attendees can find you next and anything that you want to tell the audience about as your work or anything. Reverse alphabetical by first or sorry, last first. name? <laughs> I'm sorry, I should have clarified that. So Stephen, you're up. Oh, okay. Um, right now I'm put I'm producing a show I wrote called Bums the Musical, <laughs> not the kind you sit on. About singing dancing bums in 1929 at the dawn of the Great Depression and it's a lot of fun it's a farce like I was talking about and uh, it's at the Angeles Theater in Spanish Fork this is the biggest best production I've put on it and it's awesome uh, if you want to find tickets go to bumsthemusical.com awesome I'm going to check that out, actually. That sounds great. Um, cool. For me, um, uh, you can catch me on YouTube. I've got a channel called Instead of Writing, um, which is where I do things instead of writing. Um, and I'm also looking for some reviewers uh, for my first uh, historical fantasy book called The Crimson Inkwell. If you're interested in getting a copy and, and possibly leaving me a review, go ahead and just reach out to me on Discord and shoot me a message, and I'd be happy to hook you up. Um, I am going to tomorrow. I have a few panels. Um, I have one at noon, editing versus rewriting. And uh, as far as where you can find me, you can find my books anywhere where books are sold. And I've got an exciting new venture coming out with my publisher that is going to be more audiovisual. And that's exciting. And I, I, I don't know. I don't even know what I can actually say and not say. So maybe that's enough. But I'm excited about it. It's going to be really cool. Awesome. <laughs> All right, um, I'm on a panel tomorrow about developmental editors, if you need to learn more about that stage of editing process. Um, and then I also have um, a blog, uh, Edits by Emma, um, and you can uh, find me on Pinterest and Facebook under the same name. Happy to awesome. answer people's questions about, about editing things through those. Awesome. I'll be on a panel tomorrow at 3 p.m. Sometimes the feature isn't all that great, but it's not a dystopia either. You can find me on Twitter at J.A. Campanelli, uh, Facebook, J. Ann Campanelli. And I have um, my book, Pride and Poor Judgment, is on Kindle Unlimited for the next few months. So if you want to check it out, it is on Amazon. All right. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for all the great questions. <laughs>